Robert Ed, hardtop10.com, outside uh, Tate Modern on a particularly wet uh, day in London. And I'm just about to wander into the press view of Magdalena Apakonovich. So, let's go inside and see what happens. So, we're inside. Somebody downstairs telling me how good the exhibition is, so let's see what happens. Here it is. Magdalena Apakonovich. Okay, let's go and see what happens. So, I don't know much about Magdalena Apakonovich, but uh, as it says from the wall in the 60s and 70s, uh, she's a Polish artist. Uh, her dates in 1930 to 2017. She created large woven sculptures that became known as Apakans after her surname. Cool. These ambiguous forms made from thread and rope defied categorization and challenged the existing definitions of sculpture. I'm not entirely sure what this film is here, whether that is part to do with it or not, but um, I see we will discover more as we venture in. Um, but this exhibition surveys a transformative period of the artist's early career when her weavings came off the wall into three-dimensional space. Okay, let's go and have a look. There's more details, but I think we should get in and see what's happening. Okay, so we're heading in. Yeah, it says that uh, Abakanovich arranged her sculptures as environments to evoke a physical experience. Maybe that's kind of a pre-installation thing. But anyway, let's have a look. It's actually, even just these first moments of a glimpsing around, actually looks pretty cool. Um, it's got to say, I like that. That's not a painting, is it? That's a sort of wall hanging. But I think that's actually pretty funky. Um, probably because I've got a bit of a sort of, gives me a bit of a Cornish painter vibe, maybe a bit of a Brian Winter kind of vibe to it. But um, that's nice. Hmm, it's quite funky, actually. Oh, it looks good. So, that's been drawn into wandering through this room before, actually. Uh, Reading into the info on the wall. Quite intriguing, these sort of massive tapestries. Sorry, I'll try and move around a bit slower so you get a chance to uh, look at it all properly. Um, oh wow, look, these are quite cool. These are rather beautiful as well. I'm probably just quite. I've got to say, I do like the colours. I love stuff like this and the colours in here. You've got those greys, but then you've got those gorgeous earthy sort of um, pinks. And then that little bit of yellow in there. Oil paint on. Oh, it's a painting. I love how I've put the painting in a in like a little vitrine box and then they've put the uh, the other tapestries on the wall. All right, let's go back and just uh, see a little bit of what it says. That one's very high up, which I think is a bit silly. But other than that, I'm enjoying this room a lot. It's definitely got, for me, a kind of brown winter vibe. Um, really nice earthy colours. Look at that, that one. Man, that's got another... Mm, I can't think of the artist I want to relate that to. But let's have a little crack on here. There's a picture of her. Doing the weaving. Looks very cool. So this is room one, beginnings. Following the Second World War, Abakanovich pursued an education in painting and weaving. Interesting. Graduating from the Academy of Plastic Arts in Warsaw in 1954. This room shows the development of her work during the period that followed from 55 to 65. Interesting. Censorship and restrictions the arts imposed enforced by the Soviet regime seemed to ease in the initial mid-50s post-Stalinist thaw and transmedia experimentation flourished. Oh man, it says she lived with her husband in a cramped one room apartment and used the studio looms of established artist and weaver Maria Laskiewicz to produce large experimental works. Extraordinary, because these things are huge. If she was really living in that one bedroom apartment, it would be quite an extraordinary experience to be living in that and producing these massive things. By 1965, however, she was presented with a gold medal in applied arts at the San Paolo Biennial using the prize money to buy a bigger apartment with the studio. It says in this from paintings of living organisms, paintings of living organisms on draped fabric and present alongside early weavings and industrial designs. Let's have a stroll anyway, just to see, I think we'll go back, there's another, quite intriguing, these little boxes, look at that. And these are uh, yeah, yeah, sort of, the 
greys and the blues and the whites. I actually think the colours are really nice in these. That's something. What is it, 1950s? Maybe I'm just drawn to that kind of 1950s kind of style of things. But I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I've obviously never heard of her before. I don't know how many other people have heard of her before, but it's actually rather interesting. In particular, these big ones are stunning, aren't they? Look at that. Look at it, really cool. Where is the title of that? The title of this must be, sorry, if I wander back over here, trying to find the title of these two. Is this right? Oh, I'm so confused. Gouache on linen. Okay, I'm not entirely sure. What are the names of those? Desdemona, wool, fleece, sisal, cotton, artificial silk, and horsehair. And Helena. Oh, Helena must be the other. Yes, so it's Helena and Desdemona. Sorry. Those are the two big ones. I'm slightly confusing for a minute. And it said she created Helena as part of her commission for the 8th San Paolo Biennial in Brazil. It was one of five large scale wool weavings. Oops, I'm just falling over the pictures. Uh, each given the name of a woman, some from history or mythology. Interesting. But it's cool. Really, really good. Look at that. You can see why they won. Or got her some prize in that. So, there they are, because um, got extraordinary things. It's interesting. It was my friend who suggested I should come to this exhibition in the press view. I might not have come along otherwise, but it's actually rather good. And I'm rather pleased I've turned up. Look at the, it's quite interesting how you can see a bit more close up here of the weaving. It's actually quite interesting. Look at that, that is, I can't remember if it said horsehair, but it does feel a bit horse hairy. Interesting, it's got lovely colours within these kind of materials, hasn't it? And like here, like a nice little bit of blue lurking in there. <laughs> Let's keep on strolling down to this one here. Look at that, it's got a much richer kind of thing. I mean, they are like massive abstract paintings with sort of incredible texture added in as well. Look at them, they're quite dramatic. A sort of horse hair lurking out of the center of them. Strange things. Look, and then you've got that sort of, quite interesting, like, like a huge rope section bursting down there through the center of it. Amazing, and then more kind of horse hair sections. Look at it, it's actually really, oh man, look at these mad bits of hair pouring out of it. And the thickness of this sort of tied rope. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> really good fun coming here. All right, let's head back over to the, this, these, those, these ones seem very, um, I mean, they, uh, I suppose what's good about them is they don't look, it looks like she's just come up with the idea herself of these. Well, these ones here look much, much more like sort of copied Aboriginal uh, kind of style. Well, that's a criticism. What's this one called? Tapisserie 21 Brune. Oh, interesting. This shows evidence of her participation in state-run craft programs. Um, artists, Polish craft cooperatives employed artists as designers and artisans. This was a common source of income for artists during post-war communism, alongside their own independent artistic pursuits. Man, not like anybody here is going to help you in any way at all as an artist. I mean, here in the UK, the arts are just sort of spat upon, basically, unless you've got, um, certainly by government funding. Um, fascinating, um, rather nice, look, absolutely looks brilliant on the GoPro, it's got to be said. Those beautiful sort of very modernist kind of lines running up and down it. Almost a bit Picasso as well in a sort of almost cubisty constructed fashion. I like the other one more. I think the other one had more of a cubisty vibe for me. This is intriguing as well. I think it's nice the way she's managed to include these kind of textures. Look, you've got this little bit here that's quite thick, and then you're moving over here, and you've got this sort of thinner weave, and then you've got this... Mm, it's almost like um, 
you know, paint has a kind of a velvety feel, the different colours. It's almost like she's got these different feels into each bit of it. I mean, literally, yeah, she has got a feel because they're quite literally fabric, but yeah, that, that's rather beautiful as well. And you look at these things and you think about contemporary art, you think what rubbish it is. I mean, these are just so much better than a lot of these things. And a lot of tapestry things you see today aren't even made. I mean, they're just... Anyway. Oh, look at these. These gouache on paper. Look at the extraordinary results in here. Almost photographic, some of these. Just gouache. I'm absolutely obsessed. That looks photographic. Oh, it must be like monoprinted. These are actually rather wonderful. Monoprinted, potentially different pieces of paper. And then she's collaged back into it. Look at that. I mean, you know what's so nice is there's a real, you know, there's a real actual, um, oh, what's the way of describing it? There's a real actual, um, uh, you know, that actually made these things. So often today, things are just not made. There's no craft in it. It's all just sort of thrown together in a few seconds. Anyway, we've been in here quite a long time. Let's move on to the next room. Actually, quite interesting. Um, quite interesting this bit on the wall here. A lovely picture of her drawing there. Um, so she maintained a strong connection to the natural world and the biological organic matter of life. As she said, I see fibre as a basic element constructing the organic world and our planet. It is from fibre that all the living organisms are built. The tissue of plants, leaves and ourselves, our nerves, our genetic code, the canals of our veins, our muscles. We have fibrous structures. But more interesting, it says at the bottom, that a lot of this love of nature came from uh, living in a family's 17th century manor house deep in the Polish forest. And this bit is brilliant, where she says, strange powers dwelled in the woods and the lakes that belonged to my parents. Apparitions and inexplicable forces had their laws and their spaces. Beautiful, isn't it? That sense of her spirits in the nature. Look at that wonderful bit of wall over there. Look at that photo. So she kept all these sort of animal things and horns, etc., lying around her house. But look at it, it's got a real, for me, it makes you think of Barbara Hepworth and her wonderful studio in St. Ives. But look at these, absolutely beautiful um, charcoal drawings. Oh, yeah, look, big organic y charcoal things. Very big, actually, these drawings. That looks like a weird sort of bee creature. It's interesting. 1993. Interesting. So she was still working relatively recently, as it were. <laughs> interesting. Drawings document, so this is what it says here on the wall, drawings document her continued interest, her continued interest in the natural world and states of transformation. Working between figuration and abstraction. Yeah, I mean, they do drift between, I mean, it could be an apple, it could be something abstract. It's got a nice way of, look at that, it's rather beautiful how she's sort of almost got blurry, watery charcoal here, and then she's rubbed into the charcoal there. She's got, again, that kind of almost printed look of things that I'm guessing she has got through some kind of printing process. I mean, as in a monoprinting process, not some dramatically sophisticated one. She made many of her large-scale drawings leading over large sheets of paper positioned on the floor, as in that picture down there at the beginning. Um, whoo, one of these rooms where the whole thing's a bit mind-blowing. You feel kind of dizzy, actually, with the giant photo. But it is rather interesting. Oh, look, these must be the other things she had in the house. These sort of bits of rope. Oh, maybe these are the things she was drawing. I'm sure it is. Look at these, very fibrous rope. Well, that weird sort of thing, that's like a sort of, um, you know, like a sort of um, sackcloth, but it has a sort of vibe, a sort of mummy. Oh, wow, it's going to get a bit freaky down here. Look at these things as well. That does look like a mummy. Okay, we're moving to the next room, which is actually quite mind-blowing. Probably going to freak, oh man, what is that? That is a really weird thing here on the right. Look at it. I mean, that's the kind of thing the Chapman brothers would love to have made. But, I mean, you know, it's a lot weirder than anything they made and far more evocative and interesting and sort of gives you real depth. I mean, it's got a weird sort of totemic 
influence, but at the same time, it's got a hint of a teapot and a mouth and a massive nose. It's sort of comic and frightening all at once. Oh, that's not even by her. How bizarre. A major bring away there. Unknown artist, Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Female initiation mask. This was also displayed in her studio. She travelled in 76 to Papua New Guinea to visit rainforests and journey by canoe on the Sipic River. She was especially moved by the art of various Sipic peoples, which she understood to be an expression of man's interaction with the physical and supernatural environment. A year later, she received this mask as a gift. Interesting how she's interested in that interaction with the supernatural environment. That's what I always liked about kind of like Sigma Polka and some of those other artists. I mean, look at that. That is by her pregnant. Oh, that's quite interesting. I mean, it is like something emerging out of the wall. Emerging from this sort of heavy sort of material. Look at that when you move in. I think you've still got the sort of mad horse hair on the edges. And this sort of thing bursting out. I've got to say, this room is actually genuinely quite frightening. Look, you've got these huge... Oh, so she started taking them off the wall and now they're hanging. In reality, which is... They are actually quite totemic. As I keep saying, you've got a feeling of sort of... Aztecs and Indians and... Extraordinary vibe. Look at that massive weird thing. It's like a... Almost like a huge squid. Let's escape the ocean and come into the earth. The massive rope bits. The rope bits on the down ground don't get me as much, other than they have a sort of squid vibe to them. But the actual massive things themselves, I hope you can see it well enough with the GoPro. GoPro is not brilliant in low light. And look at these. Amazing. Look at that lovely sort of look. You can go almost, I mean, you can't actually go inside, but you can almost go inside that, like inside that squid. Actually, you can smell it as well. You've actually got quite a strong smell of the material, which is quite intriguing, quite visceral. There it goes, it's sort of entrails. Oh, have a quick... Let's see what it says here. Fibrous forest. Baffled by the ambiguity of Abakanovich's work in 1964, an art critic first coined the term Abakans after the artist's surname. Abakanovich later adopted this term to refer to her large three-dimensional works, which she presented in dense arrangements. Interesting. So I guess this is kind of how it would have been, all these things. And they're quite threatening when they're all put together like that, but not in a bad way, you know, in a sort of, uh, you know, um, you could say supernatural slash spiritual kind of way of evoking a change in your, uh, uh, not sanity, a change in your um, surroundings, sort of transcendental states, almost bringing light around. When installing her exhibition, she determined the placement often clustering words together in dialogue with each other and the gallery space. She recalled her installations as situations and later as environments, into which she introduced found elements alongside her handwoven forms. <sighs> yes, yeah, so they've grouped them here together to echo some of her own installations. And they recall her interest in the forest's ability, forest's ability to provide shelter. If they were her escape from categories in art, they could not be classified to larger than me. They were safe, like the hollow trunk of the old willow I could enter as a child in search of hidden secrets. Well, that very much like this one where I was peering inside, that certainly seems to have a sort of hollow interior she would go into. That's quite... Look at that. That's like a huge kind of... I know I keep thinking they look like jellyfish. Probably an absolutely stupid thing to say, but I can't help feeling there's a bit of a jellyfish vibe to them. They're strange. I mean, they could be disturbing to wander through. But, it, oh, for some reason, they don't feel disturbing. They feel quite friendly. Look at that. Even though that's dark and black, look at the lovely sort of material of it. <laughs> look at that massive thing over here. I mean, they are huge, these things. Quite. Oh, man, look, there's a strange green one hanging in the corner. Look at that. 
It's interesting, once she moves them off the wall into the space, they're far more interesting, far more perfecting actually. I like the whole feeling that it's almost like she's fighting for some kind of spiritual experience that's sort of mystifying you, blowing you away. I do feel there's a sort of attempt of a sort of transformational, meditative, mystical experience for you. Yeah, it's quite a cool video over there. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Oh, look at this one. It's almost like a sort of tree trunk seen from under the ground looking up. And look, and you've got, still got this kind of fibrous horsehair existence experience. Actually, there's sort of more kind of fibrous experience to it here. That's quite a cool video. Look, there she is pulling one of these up into place. Kind of funky film, actually. I mean, it's amazing you get back to these things. Oh, it says here, oh, so literally this must be this. So in 69, she collaborated with avant-garde film director Jarostor Brzozowski, an experimental composer, Bogoslaw Schaffer, to create the film uh, Abakani. The strange lunar and desert-like landscape is in fact the sand dunes of Slowinski National Park in Libra on the Baltic coast of Poland. <laughs> the film captures the effect of the fibers blowing in the wind. It's quite a strange thing. I mean, 69, it's quite kind of trippy, really, isn't it? It's frankly quite trippy being in this room. You feel a bit weird. But like I said, in a good way, just try and pan slowly around these things which are just bizarre. Quite interesting, I mean, because this is not really designed for children. Most, oh man, you keep freaking out as you look at these things and your head spins because it's quite mind blowing. Last time I had a weird mind blowing experience in the Tate was looking at Sigma Polka where I had to escape from the building because the whole thing was so weird. And it was the same time as David Blaine was outside in a plastic box and I was obsessed. He'd stolen my energy on the way in. Um, like this petrified organism. This is a little bit more about what she was doing in the 70s. Sorry, I've jumped around in a non-consecutive bit. The work shown here is a total situation divided by the artist, comparing a pair of giant garment-like hanging forms that have been created from industrially woven cloth and ropes that spill out onto the floor. Right, let's go around. That, that, that's good, but these bits are the best bit. I'm going to turn the GoPro for a moment, we'll just get a slightly wider look on it so you can get a bit more of a vibe of the whole room. Okay, so I'll switch to a slightly wider angle thing so you can just get a little vibe of it, I'll just give you a little slow look around it. It is quite a mind-blowing exhibition, frankly. Uh, I can't remember if I finished what I was saying, but you know, often, often obviously you always try and make things for kids. You might enjoy exhibitions. So half the stuff you get these days is not really like art, it's just like sort of entertainment for children basically, so it's an excuse to get them here. You know, like the Turban Hall is always filled with big stuff. Um, but I mean, I think a child would quite enjoy this without it necessarily having been made for a child. I mean, things are always so complicated these days and organised. I mean, I don't know why children shouldn't be able to enjoy, you know, something that's sort of got a weird, formative, supernatural vibe to it. I do like the whole supernatural vibe. She's actually trying to sort of spin your mind and spin your head, which is nice. Look at that. That's almost got, like, weird eyeballs. This one here, like a ghost coming for you. I mean, there's something kind of magical about them all genuinely magical, even if you look at them from the side you still get these hair coming out, it reminds me of other things, almost like much smaller kind of things you'd see on Indian clothing maybe magnified, so it's you know, just make you go completely potty almost as if you've been miniaturised in the world, and you're seeing these giant, you're seeing these tiny things, there's like a sort of tiny creature, you've been miniaturized and you're now seeing these huge things flying around. Right, so here we go, strolling into the last room. Um, well, let's see what happens, still kind of wild and freaky, you can see the stuff behind me. Um, 
It says here, this is number six, Invented Anatomy. Frustrated being labelled a fibre artist, Abakanovich began to use other materials in the 80s, though she continued to use burlap and sizzle to make increasingly figurative sculptures. 78, she began to use her as ambiguous form of subtle embryology, made from a combination of fabrics and fibres, bundled and bounded into rounded organic mass. Charlotte Venice Biennale, etc. What does she say? It's got to do when she talks. Or well, sort of what she says. She says, The contents, the inside, the interior of soft matter fascinated me. By soft, I meant organic alive. What is organic? What makes it alive? In which region of throbbing begins the individuality? In which region of throbbing begins the individuality of matter, its independence, existence? They were completing my physical need to create bellies, organs, and invented anatomy. Finally, a soft landscape of countless pieces related to each other. Which is going down to Right, sorry, we'll keep on moving around here. So actually, oh God, sorry, freaky. I just get a bit freaked out sometimes in these massive rooms with these big. God, this bit's really disturbing. It's actually less disturbing in the darker sections. Right here in the bright light, you feel like you might go completely insane. I didn't really like. I thought this cheesy one over here, a bit like um, two lungs joined together. It's not my favourite. I don't I was going to say, and I don't necessarily like these sort of um, material boulders over here in the corner as much as the other bits. But these big red and yellow ones are just profoundly disturbing. It's almost like you're inside some kind of body seeing huge, I don't know, red blood cell platelets floating around on your head. There's a really disturbing shadow down here. Oh, it's from this piece here. It's quite difficult to work out what it's from. Oh God, this is making me feel really weird. Look at all these massive boulders. Even though I'm not really into the boulders, they're all sort of making me feel a bit weird. But these red and yellow and orange things are really good. I really find them quite hard to look at. I don't know if I can even, I try and walk through them. I just find them a bit mind blowing for some reason. I know what it is. All right, they're not as disturbing when you walk through them. <sighs> Something really weird about them. It's not even the textures of them, it's just their weird shapes that is, for some unknown reason, quite disturbing. Still got those rather nice drawings. Still, if we go, that is actually really disturbing as well, that orange one. Why is that orange thing dropping down from nowhere? Really weird. It's quite... Oh, I hadn't noticed it's actually popping out of that sort of hole in the ground. It's slightly disturbing. And I was going to say, I prefer the ones that were meant to be sort of crazy spiritual stuff to these, but this room is really disturbing and making me feel incredibly dizzy, which in a weird way I think is a good thing. Um, look at it, absolutely bizarre. It's these three that I find most profoundly disturbing. Really weird. Okay, so we're strolling out of this room with the giant mad things and um, heading off into, I think that was that was the last of it really, heading off into this little bit here outside where it's got little films and um, quotations. The quotations are actually genuinely quite interesting. I like neither rules nor instructions, these enemies of imagination. I make use of the technique of weaving by adapting it to my own ideas. My art has always been a protest against what I've met with in weaving. Nice. I never felt my studio was small except when I had to move big pieces out of it. I had to go through the window of the tenth floor. I had an enormous view from my windows and I lived more in this view than in the room. Mentally I was in Polish forests in the Polish country which I love in an extremely strong way, because I know every end, I know every leaf, I know every piece of grass. This is my world, and I never got out of it since childhood. The whole building looks really quite weird and disturbing after all the things there. I mean, Tate Modern is quite a weird building, in all honesty, isn't it? Um, but yeah, the whole thing just looks a bit stranger. Oh, check it out. Picture of fur in the forest, that's kind of cool. I use the tree as a metaphor for the ecological architecture of the 21st century. Just as the human body served as a metaphor, the shape of a Romanesque cathedral. I kind of feeling the later stuff is not quite as possibly she's being buffeted by contemporary art. Um, I'm feeling she has to change what she does for it. 
you know, make things a bit more literal. Whereas I think her best bits, look at this, it's pretty cool. Her best bits are when they're it's actually really quite disturbing as well. Her best bits are when they're just not, you know, so literally organised is when they're more. I think the supernatural forest bit is interesting. I do think she's got quite a sort of Barbara Hepworth vibe to her actually that sort of I mean Hepworth probably said this just about every film I make he used to go up onto those sort of tours in Cornwall and lie on the ground waiting for the magicness of the um, rocks to speak to her look at this one I mean I love those Barbara Hepworth sculptures I have a feeling of aliens have come to visit you and they've left these giant stones look that's got a similar vibe to it I do love these things that kind of change your outlook. I think I'm actually going to go home and do some paintings that try and do push you into a transcendental state, which is what I always wanted to do, really. Interesting. Arboreals symbolise our concern with nature, which neglected and abused by man, now turns against him with vengeance. They remind us that a tree is our friend. It gives shade and oxygen, bears fruit, shelters birds and animals, and makes climate hospitable to all. So, I mean, she is sort of taking what was sort of unformed, beautiful I love of the forest, and she's turning it more into a climate change thing, which, oh man, look at that amazing picture here of her standing in those gigantic things. It's even bigger than what they've got here. Um, I guess you can't help as an artist trying to drag yourself back into what's taking place contemporary. If everything is about climate change and those things, what choice do you have? Um, Says here, I'm not quite sure, but this is the first show. What an excitement. I came one hour before the opening to check all the details. I could not enter. The door was locked. The next day we learned the authorities found the show to be formalistic, and that means not engaged with building socialism. Plus the tendency disapproved in art. The show was closed before it ever opened. We realised that the thaw had come after Stalin's death was over. The old rules returned. Intriguing. <coughs> right. Anyway, absolutely fascinating. Done a lot of really cool work. Look at those crazy, nice photos of her here at the end. Right, well, just for a bit of summing up, I'm going to stroll back into the mega rooms. And so, what am I going to say? I wasn't actually thinking of coming to this exhibition until my friend said you should go and see it, and he was absolutely right. It's absolutely extraordinary exhibition, quite genuinely bizarre. I love the whole delving into the supernatural of the world, delving into the supernatural forest. Um, you still got these crazy giant red and orange bits behind me. I think this forest section over here is still actually my favourite spot. This bit is mental to blow your mind, but I love this foresty bit. The foresty bit has got a weird, you almost got a fecundity of a forest in it. You can feel the leaves and the trees. I think it's absolutely amazing, this bit. Um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant show. Quite astonishing. Not what I was expecting at all, and really quite wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, you should definitely come and see it in real life, because it does blow you away. Anyway, there we go. And as ever, like and subscribe so you can hear more about all the exhibitions taking place in London and around the world. But obviously it's primarily London. Um, but yeah, if you subscribe, you'll find out the reviews of the shows as they appear. And also subscribe to my other channel, Travel Dog, which is about food and travel. So, you know, it's a bit like our top ten, but a bit more frivolous and fun where we test out food and we go around the world. Um, so, until then, Alfie Dezane, Hadarafiz, bye bye. See you all soon.